Okay. Hi, uh, good afternoon everyone. This is a bit different for me, this talk, because normally they're kind of really well planned. Well, I think they're well planned. Um, and I know kind of what's coming next. But because this is about primate, which is literally pull requests are coming in left, right and centre, um, I can start going over what the talk looked like yesterday and tomorrow it, it would have been different because this thing's moved and that's not there anymore and what have you so hopefully I won't fall into too many traps but um, I'll try and uh, keep, do it as well as I can. As Giles said uh, I'm currently the VP I'm about to pass well I was going to say pass on that's not quite what I'm planning to do I'm about to uh, be holding open the vote for the next VP to start uh, in the next few weeks but at the moment I'm still there um, yeah I've been I'm getting old basically I think is what the the gist of all this is I've been working with CloudStack since uh, early 2012 I think it was so um, I've been around it a long long time um, I guess we, we skipped over the shape blue thing. We basically all we do is work with CloudStack. We work with in the community. Uh, we do support for CloudStack. We write features for CloudStack. Cloud, it's just CloudStack's our thing. Um, so to the actual uh, thing for, I'm going to talk about, which is Primate, and I'll start off with uh, going back a little bit with a brief history. Um, with, I think this is the second iteration, this is the current UI. Um, there was one that came before this, it looked mostly the same, but some of the icons changed and some things changed whether they were um, how they look, but almost was identical. It's just very subtle differences. So this is what people are used to working with um, most of the time at the moment. Now, it's, it's kind of architecture is it's based in jQuery and it's a, a single page app so it's just one thing that loads right at the start and that's it everything else is done in JavaScript um, queries made and then most queries will be made when you enter a page but then when you try and when you start doing things that's then just using the data you already had so um, it's not particularly dynamic the JavaScript framework was actually kind of, if you like, invented. It was a bespoke for the um, UI. And any kind of WebJet, any uh, dial and um, view that you see was custom made. There was nothing off the shelf about it at all. Everything is um, done, was done manually from programming point of view. Um, the programmer words, the, basically what it's saying is that whenever we said we want to show this thing here there was no predefined widget where we just said well here's the data show it here we actually had to program a circle with a dial which then changed angle depending on the amount of um, uh, storage you had everything was hand done and having to be written to do exactly what we wanted and um, there was a lot of old well it is only old style CSS which runs to or something like 10 uh, multiple thousands of lines of CSS that is just the main page um, uh, and you try changing one bit and then everything shoots over like this and you have no idea why it did that uh, and in the end you go oh screw it it's, I'll leave it as it was <laughs> um, so that was the, the kind of physical architecture and then we've got kind of the, the experience of it uh, there's no browser history that you're storing so you have the one URL and then you're flying around to say just using JavaScript to move things around inside that page so if you ever press back you instantly regret it because you're now in whatever the page was before you went into CloudStack um, and there's no context held with it so again if you press refresh you find yourself either logged out and at the front login page or just right back at the kind of dashboard um, which is again often very uh, um, frustrating uh, probably 10 times worse for new users of CloudStack because the first thing when it's not doing what you want you press refresh and then you're kind of thrown out from uh, the programmer's point of view or kind of all of the previous page means it's really hard to extend and it's really hard to integrate it with other things because you've got this different information coming in that CloudStack just or the UI just doesn't know how to do has nothing internal to do to deal with it so you if we create a new feature and have to do the UI part for it 
we basically have to reinvent showing it. There's nothing we can use to base on. You occasionally find, you'll, you'll sometimes find a typo where someone's copy pasted some other bit of the UI to recreate and make for a new um, feature and missed that something was still there from before. Um, and as uh, you can see, we've got thousands of lines of code, 22,000 lines of code in the, um, the system JS, which is the global settings and all of that section. Um, which, as I said, it makes hard to maintain, develop and extend, but um, it's also difficult for people to just get a handle on it. And it, to be honest, scares them off. You get new people who are coming who would want to do something and then they look at this UI that they're going to have to try and put it into at some point and um, run a mile and think, or oh, it's just not worth it. And also when we're quoting and, and telling people how long it may take to do a feature, we have to put in a, a ridiculously high number for doing the UI because it's such hard work. It's so um, very, very pernickety and difficult to get to, to do anything. Um, and then people are kind of, oh, can we just have the API instead? Uh, which is fine, but obviously to get most people still see CloudStack as the UI and what they can see there and don't realize there's a load of other things kind of hidden away. Um, and then the way it is hard-coded and if you like locked to CloudStack's release. You can't fix something in the UI um, and release it. You've got to wait till the next CloudStack release because it's just part of the uh, core CloudStack code. So you can't separate those out. So um, what happened is uh, initially Rohit and I, uh, there was a few of about, I guess about a year and a bit ago, year and a half, year or so ago, there were a couple of different bits of a UI knocking around. There was a um, company in, um, in Russia that had done one, was it Bit Systems they were, Bit Works they were. Um, there were a few others who have done parts of a UI, but nothing covered all of CloudStack. They were built for particular uses. And we looked at those and Rohan and I sat down and said, okay, so if we were to start from scratch and write the list of things we'd want the UI to do for end users and work, how we'd want it to be working under the hood for developers to be able to work with it and to make it easier for them, and to just give it kind of longevity, what kind of things would we have? And then we can look at the options that are out and see how close these are to that that kind of um, uh, I, those ideas. Um, we started off. We wanted things like um, the idea of uh, data-driven information, so that cloud this uh, this data would come in and then it would present it and we wouldn't have to do all the work to then say right well if you here are all the things I want you to literally API call I want you to go and get me that bit of information then that bit of information and then I'll put it into a table we want it just to come in and then be able to place it as we wanted uh, things like that we already have is the text and label translation so we wanted to keep obviously that we can um, uh, change language easily um, URL routing. So that's where, uh, and I'll demonstrate it physically, um, you can actually follow the URL of where you are in the uh, UI and back would take you back to the place you just came from with that URL. But also you, if you are assuming the person you're sharing a URL with um, has privileges to see the same thing, you could actually copy and paste the URL and they could open it and go to exactly where you were. Oh. Hmm? Very good. Oh. <laughs> um, we wanted a, a cross kind of plugin support because the way CloudStack, uh, the UI was written, um, and say everything was just done on its own. So we wanted to be able to say, okay, well, we're in one part of the UI and I can see I've got this network and this st storage, but I want to be able to click on that storage and then go into the storage view, not have to go my all the way back and find my way back to where I'd come from. Um, and then we had views on uh, general displays and notifications and alerts and what have you. Um, 
and part of it was about separating the data collection from the displaying of data as I said we had to explicitly go and get bits of data before um, and we had ideas around uh, how it needed to be in order to get people to use it and people to extend it and people to want to work with it so we wanted to obviously be easy to learn and develop um, and cus be customizable so we then said well in that case to do that we need to not have our own frameworks we need to use open source projects that we can work with um, so we want to you know bring it up to date and use the things that people these days are going to want to use um, we don't want to have to go out and find COBOL programmers to be able to work on the UI we want the people who are going to be excited about oh this is the this is the stuff um, and also with the libraries and buttons, we wanted to make it easy for us to keep it, uh, keep standardization by using uh, libraries of icons and images rather than people making them up and going, oh, well, this looks a bit like a whatever. Um, and almost there. And um, so rather than the imperative, uh, uh, language we wanted a declarative one we wanted to be able to say I want a table here and I want that data in it and then let it sort itself out not I need you to get that bit of data and I want you to put it there and then I want you to loop so that I've got them here 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 and here um, the API discovery again is about making it easier for uh, one version of the UI to be able to work with a new cloud stack so what cloud monkey does is uh, if you do cloud monkey sync and it's connected to a uh, management server it goes and polls and finds out all of the APIs all of the things that are required uh, parameters in that API and what they are so that when you type uh, list and then tab you get the things you can list like hosts or zones or what have you volumes um, and that way cloud monkey isn't tied to a specific version of cloud stack and so we wanted the same in the UI that it wasn't didn't have to be completely hard-coded to a version and because only that version of the uh, UI knew the API's that are in this version of the uh, uh, management server um, and other pieces where we were getting using data and here we're talking about so a user may not be allowed to view a particular it might for some reason you might have created a role where a user can't view um, volumes in which case we don't want to show the user volumes but we want the ui to just see well my, the, they don't have a list volumes api so there's no point showing it to them um, rather than have to write the logic that they had but then had to go and say does the user have um is the user allowed to view volumes? Yes. Okay, well here's your volumes icon. Is the user allowed to view uh, snapshots? Yes. Okay, well here's it. Rather than have to do that, what we wanted is the UI, the framework, to be able to figure that out for itself. Um, so what kind of happened next is we took our great big list and we looked at everything about obviously including the current UI and said could that be just manipulated a bit and thought well nothing really covers those that we wouldn't have to start from scratch There's, we haven't got something out there already that people are doing that ticks the vast majority of the boxes of what we'd want for us to then kind of really plow effort into going forward and what happened next was I kind of forgot about it and got on with other things um, over the same time what happened next was Rohit um, and Rohit didn't want to let that lie um, and uh, I guess now about nine months ago ish um, we were having a company get together and he said uh, I've got this thing that I think I'd like to show people what do you think oh, I want to get your opinion if you you know are you, you going to get behind this uh, do you think we can get the community to get behind this um, and he showed me a an early a very early version of what we've now calling primate I went, wow that's good uh, but what about our list remember we had this list and he goes yeah, yeah that's what I used I used the list to fit of, of things we wanted to do um, I use that to to decide what to use and he, he's got reams and reams of all the different um, frameworks and platforms and software and libraries and whatever he'd all tried to try and find what would do 
all the things that we'd said would be a good thing if our, uh, this new UI could do. Um, and what he'd found was um, Vue.js. Um, he's worked through it and I, I think he did a talk at um, back in um, Las Vegas where he went through a lot of the reasoning of the exact whys and wherefores of what he was looking at, but he was looking at Vue.js um, with a thing called Ant Design, which which kind of gave a, a, a formality, if you like, to the actual design of things. It made it so that um, otherwise, still, even with Vue.js, you could still go all over the place. And we wanted a um, a design language where people would be forced is the wrong word, but you know, to make it easy for people to do a new widget that looks the same as the other widgets, that look like it was integrated, that looks like part of the same thing. Uh, otherwise we'd go, be back to every man for himself making things that didn't look like they were supposed to be working together. And so that kind of clean look we could get through Ant Design and Vue.js. Um, we could do that configuration and role-based rendering of buttons and actions so we can work out you're not allowed to stop VMs, it's not in the role you've got. Well then we won't show you the stop VM button. Uh, it would give us that router history and browser history uh, coming up. Um, we can do, we can actually even have a local storage um, we can extend it to have local storage and keep notifications and be polling. Uh, we can do the translations. Uh, it also, uh, one of the problems you would probably find with the old uh, UI is when you're going from one laptop to a desktop which might have a bigger screen and then potentially you're looking at it on a tablet or even potentially a phone. Um, Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. If you've got a big screen, you feel like there's loads of wasted space around the outside. If you've got a small screen, you're kind of trying to cram it in, scrolling backwards and forwards. Um, using this, it's much easier for it to be dynamic. Um, and, uh, and just look much better and cleaner. We've got the declarative programming that we were after. Um, we were able to, or more specific, specifically Rohit was able to write a, a, a piece that would work with it, that would do the API auto-discovery. Um, for developers there was things like hot reloading, which I won't demonstrate, I think Rohit may do in his talk, where actually if you've got the um, Node.js server running and you change the code, you give it a second and the web page you see will actually just change. So it sees that something's changed and we'll reload that page for you. So for developers who were used to having to write something for uh, the old UI, then compile CloudStack, then go and spin up a, a management server and look at what they've ended up with, this is a, it takes seconds as opposed to half an hour plus for any change. Um, so that will makes that development piece so much more e easy. Um, and because it's Vue.js and Ant Design, it's something that people can really um, uh, get behind. It's something that will be interesting and uh, uh, applicable to modern web developers. Um, then what happened is once he demonstrated it and uh, you know then showed a, a whole load of people at Shape Blue and everyone thought it was great, when went out to the community and said, "Well, what do you think of this? This is uh, a thing we've." started up, or Rohit started up. Um, obviously it's a big job for to do and it needs a community behind it. Um, so a special interest group was created, uh, Giles alluded to that we suddenly started sprouting them, um, which is great. It means that there's, it can concentrate effort on the different parts of CloudStack. Um, so most of, of in the group uh, development have been engineers who are working at ShapeBlue and eWork. Um, for actual writing a code. We've had other input, people um, whose specialism is testing, um, particularly testing UIs, um, all sorts of other, other ideas and what have you, and support as well. Uh, um, hardware has been um, donated by, I should say, uh, PC Extreme. So lots of parts of the community sort of helping out and lending a hand where they can.
which should. Ha! Ah. Ah. <laughs> now, now the tricky bit. Um, so what for. Chair. Uh, I'll, I'll stand. I'll, I'll just lean. Uh, thank you. So for the uber geeky, um, this demo is running purely on Windows. It's um, this is the uh, this is Ubuntu 18, the uh, Windows WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux. So I just compiled the, um, as you can see, the, the code of Primate, as I said. Every day I did that, I got something different, uh, which made this a challenge, uh, and then run it from there. At the same time, I am running... Um, oh, it looks like the blank screen. So, uh, ooh, be careful. I'm running Docker uh, and I'm running um, a simulator which is CloudStack's um, kind of semi test dev engine because it means it's not going to be throwing errors all the time because it's not connected to physical hosts. Uh, obviously, this is a uh, we're not even in tech preview for. Um, uh, primate, so I don't want to press delete and delete everything in someone's environment, even though I only wanted to delete one thing, just in case something was wrong inside. Um, so um, I'm running simulator in a Docker container on Windows, and then running the subsystem and talk, getting the two to talk to each other. So that's for the extra uh, geeky amongst you and me. Um, so this is our nice, friendly, new um, uh, sign-on page. So I'll start by... I'll start as a... I probably need this uh, extended rather than duplicated rather than extended. Right, I'll start by logging in. So as you saw, discovering features, it's seeing what's, what, it, what you're allowed to do. I'll come up and hit start off with my a dashboard. So we've gone to a lot cleaner uh, view on here. We've got our events coming down here in a kind of timeline thing. It's worth pointing out that this, the, the, the remit, if you like, of the tech preview was to try and get all the functionality that's in the old UI in the new one. So you could see what everything is in there. Um, this is a tech preview. We know there are bugs. We expect there to be bugs. We haven't even really started on the bug fixing part. Um, but what it will do is it will get it out there for the world and most importantly the community to see, give views, get feedback. Um, obviously this has a, we have to be guard against this becoming the world's biggest bike shed um, where everyone, everyone has a view on. If I start saying what what font should this be? I'll get 20 different answers and a fight will break out and all sorts. So we're, we've got to go through a process of saying, okay, well now we've done it and we've done things a bit like they were before and a bit different. What, what, what does it really need to look like? But that's kind of the next iteration that we'll get to the timeline in a bit. Um, I assume that's my pop-out name. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't moved since yesterday. So, if I come to here, I st I'll start off with my uh, compute. You see I've got a load of virtual machines that I've created in here. Um, I'll start by drilling into one of them. Um, do I need to... So can you still see that okay? The back? Yeah, it's big enough. Um, so at the moment, as I say, because all these things are half down to taste, half down to... They're, they're obviously bad ways to display things, and there's better ways to display things, but then you get into very much personal taste. Um, we've got down the left-hand side the kind of quick view of the things you want to be able to see, the size of your disk, your memory, your CPU, obviously the state. You've got some of the uh, sections up here to say what you can do with this uh, simulator is because it's in the simulator um, hypervisor. Um, got your instance names and what have you. This left-hand side is where you kind of drill more into things. I mean, one for instance, one of the, my preferences would be for that to start off um, 
closed, not expanded. Um, and then I'll expand it if I want to, just to not have so much uh, data. But other people are like, oh, no, no, I want to see it all. So maybe at some point, as I say, what you can do because it's using this platform is you could start saying, well, then we'll have some persistence. We'll have, we'll make this into an actual application. And then you can start having persistence and say, well, my preference is for them to start off closed and that that's what I'm going to have. Um, but then, as you see, we've got this uh, network here. And if I click on my network, I now can see the information about this network. And from there, I can start drilling into other things. But before I get too lost in there, I'll go back over here. What I should also show is uh, VM groups. If I start going clicking into things, Windows VMs, you can see I've got the um, ID of the VM in there. If I start going into here, I'll get and clicking yep, a 404. A VM group, where else is going there? Was it? Obviously, probably other people wouldn't be able to go and look at uh, my domain and my user. But you can see in Thip, if they could, I can just cut and paste this and say, This is where I was. And you can go look at it rather than just getting the original thing. And my uh, back button now actually works. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> hey. So. I'm not, yeah, my refresh should work as well. Um, where do we get to? Right, so we got instances. Now, interestingly, this has been there since forever. Um, instance groups, but and it's a tiny little optional color, uh, uh, field when you're creating the VM. But you can actually expose it in CloudStack. Um, it's just I think because it's not exposed in the UI, really, no one really re realized it's there. Um, well, we stumbled across it, and so the next step from there will be to be able to go into my Windows VMs group, um, and now I can go and view the instances in my Windows VM group. Uh, so you can now group things that I'd kind of like personally to be able to um, group these by my groups that I create on the other thing as well. Um, but again, as I say, that's kind of, well, that wasn't there before, so it's okay, we haven't done something new like that yet. But now we'll be looking at, well, what would we do next with it? Uh, so we've got instance groups. We've got uh, our keys, as you'd expect. Also, actually, if I start here, my search has hopefully got an awful lot better than it used to be when, I thought it was dynamic, but... Bus did I have VM? Um, sure my search should be able to catch things like uh, what it was based on, but it didn't look like it did. Sent us. Mm -hmm. Am I pressing the wrong bit of the button? No, that's just a do. Um, I'll check with Rohit what that does because I'm sure that used to do more. Um, so I'm in my VM here. I have my icons now here for updating the VM. Oh. Too soon. Rebooting, reinstalling. Can you start the console session? Uh, I don't know if that's done yet, no, because it's going to be a new... Uh, well, hopefully by the time we get to launching this fully, we'll be using no VNC, so it'll be a different console type thing anyway. Uh, where am I? Um, oh, there's my languages. Languages, um, I think you have to log out and log back in again. It's hard to do this looking in two directions at once. But it's pretty instantaneous. Switching language now. I assume which, yeah, I was just, I was suddenly wondering, should I look or will I just embarrass everyone? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is network adapters really still? So, someone, someone has, needs to go through a few of these, I think. I think. I think the thing was, it was what translation 
they've used the existing translation yeah. forms, and if there isn't translation, yeah. it's just not. Good. So that's, yeah. that's some work for the German community. <laughs> yeah, there's basically a file, just a file, where um, this bit will be something like vm dot identification dot label, and for every language, there'll be what that is. Um, if there isn't one, it will just fall back to English. So, um, I guess what we probably need is some big dashboard um, which shows us all the, la the languages we've got and what coverage there is. And then it's up to the groups in those countries to get themselves sorted and, and put the translations in. Sounds like something for a new VP to do. Anyone? Is he, is he hiding or has he gone out? Um, right, where were we? Uh, so we're in, we're in here, we've got our disks, uh, we've got our buttons. What's that? Oh, that might be the console. I wonder if it works. I'm going to say no. Some pop up looker, maybe. Well, it's had a go at it. Pop up looker. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got a console button. There's also another one over here, I think. I think that's also the console. But it's not obvious. Um, we've looked around there. We've got information specifically. Mm, shouldn't be showing that. Okay. Um, where are we? We've done the SSH keys. And it's hard enough doing this, so I'm going to put it back in English. Um, the affinity groups we can see. Let's have a look in storage. Is there, is there any option for changing the, the language in the console here? Keyboard. The keyboard? Uh, at the moment, that's something that's nastily hard coded, those four or five, so okay. not at the moment. Yes, yeah, sir? Actually, you should wait for, let's say, 4.15 when we get the new Novi and C integration, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, that's so it's, it's better than the yeah. solution. Um, and I think that allows keyboard mapping. Well, in fact, we won't have to do keyboard mappings then if, once we move to no VNC. Um, as you can see, we've got all the usual things you'd expect to see for volumes as well. Um, we do have uh, sorting by anything you like of these. I can't remember if you can actually move these around. No. Um, we've only got 10 of them, but we've got pagination. So instead of trying to do the infinite scroll thing, which generally gets quite annoying, um, you can pick how many items you want per page and then move backwards and forwards through the pages, uh, depending on the view you want. Uh, our snapshots are there and work, and that's been working away. It's oh, nice because I actually started doing these, um, I think you can see, uh, at lunchtime today. And it's merrily trundling away, creating snapshots for me. Um, I think built in, uh, Vue.js has the kind of general uh, OS images. So it just adds a bit of interest to the page to have the OS uh, type actually visible there. Um, <coughs> where are we? So it's like VM snapshots as well. What have we got up here? Anything like Sora? So one thing we've noticed is, because we want to still show things, actions that aren't available, say, at the moment, um, but could be if you did some other action. So, for instance, stop a VM, um, or change password's a better one. You don't normally see the change password uh, icon unless the VM's actually stopped, which stops people from realizing they can't change the password, because most of the time they'll see the VM it's running. Um, but we want to make that so that that's greyed out. But as you can see, it's kind of a grey kind of icon in the first place. So um, I think it was Alex pointed out, it doesn't really stand out. So we've got to think about how we make that stand out, a greyed out icon and a not greyed out icon. Um, in snapshots, networks. Now networks, obviously, once you, particularly in VPCs, gets uh, really uh, complex. Um, but we still, as we were, listing them. Um, 
we've got our networks let's go for let's start off in the vpc so i found a good creative vpc and have um all of my tiers in there i can view the instances that are actually connected on that vpc which is handy and fortunately i've hidden my back button so i need to go back and get it yay um <laughs> So uh, let's go for the options. See, we've got normal network. I can go and see my IP addresses. We also obviously know that uh, we're trying to reduce some of the clicking around where you lose the context of where you were. So once your three kind of clicks down in the old UI, you then forget oh, yeah, which, which IP address is the one I'm even looking at now. Um, so we try to keep some flow and context and have sort of tabs across the top rather than having to keep drilling down instead. Um, but here we are, here's my networks and so I can now just go across here and see my rules, VPNs uh, and what have you without kind of leaving the main main area. Um, uh, where were we? So that's a normal um, network. And now I want to go into VPC. Uh, details, networks. Ah, oh, there we go. So there are the tiers in my networks. And obviously, if I just go and click on that, I'm going to get thrown back over to the guest network that's the tier. Um, quite handily, you can see now the instances that are within that network as well. Um, if there were internal load balancers, obviously you can see they would be appearing there. But it's kind of handy, you can see that they're not at the moment. Public IP addresses, ones I've ad added. I can see which is my source net there. I've got ACL, so we've got, you can see, uh, very good coverage across all the things you can do in there. I can pop into there and get the data on there. And again, I was just kind of belaboring the point a bit, but if you then said to someone, oh, I can't get my site-to-site -site VPN working, you can actually then give them that URL and the admin or whoever can actually just go and look at it and see what you're seeing and see uh, the exact configuration without kind of having to dig around. Uh, where were we? Gateways and VPN connections. So that's our views there. Um, security groups. So I've not done a lot of testing and playing with the uh, basic networks yet, but um, we've got this, the views and the things you need to do in there with our security groups. See the public IP addresses. I should try it. Let's see if I can break it, shall we? Let's see if I go here, can I set up a static NAT? Um, uh, uh, guest network. Uh, that's my what's it one. So that'd be the easiest one. My IP addresses. Is that added IP address? Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Now, if I do this, so I want. Uh, 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 uh. Ah. Up here. Yay. And I'll connect it to that one. Must be nice to see. No. Oh, that's a shame. Um, I don't think I've. Oh no, I have set a couple of in there I've been playing with. And gateways. Um, one of the things we looked at is the, the, we tried to get rid of some of the drop down boxes as well. So before you kind of went into what it just said templates and then you had ISOs and, and uh, templates kind of drop down, you had to flick between them. And it's not, well, it's not very intuitive that you had to go there and do it in the first place. So that kind of thing we've just expanded out and said so we might as well just have its own subsection like that. Um, and then the normal. You can see I managed to get quite a lot of those in there, so how many can I? Go 
go and try and retrieve all that lot. Where, where, where? Oh, did I break it? Oh well. It knows they're there because it's finding them. Okay. Um, project. This is quite a nifty thing that um, it added. I should, can, if you can see a little red um, dot here, this is because I've got a project invitation. So if I click on here, I can actually accept my invitation to a project. Uh, when I go there, so I say yes, yes I do, I'm being accepted, close that, and now that has been added into my projects. And I think there's when I create a new one or try and add them. Let's have a look now, we should have some. You see, as I do things, I get notifications. Uh, if I start a VM, that would go in there. If I delete one, that goes in there, and you end up with a little list of notifications you go and look at and clear and get rid of. We've got our events. They're a bit easier to read than they were before. Um, and again, lots of pagination to make it easy to get to. Um, I'm trying to see if any of these then spring out something I can grab. Could that be interesting? No. NTN access. Okay, I think I probably at this point need to flick into being an administrator to show any more in here. So let's do that. I'll get out. Go in as admin. Right. Uh, that's handy. Um, so now I've got my got users and their accounts, and it kind of as normal. Let's go and have a nose around in one. Uh, normal stuff you'd expect to see in there. Not now, thank you. Yeah, I needed someone else in there. Um, but all our normal things, being able to disable them, change password, edit, generate keys, in them. Um, our accounts view is some is pretty similar. What's that one? Add a certificate. Ooh. Um, <laughs> update resource count. So there you go. There's one that hasn't had a. Uh, uh, a translation put against it up labeled update dot account um, don't know what they do certificates in there and then we've got uh, actual settings that relate to the account itself um, uh, users accounts domains Domains view stayed largely like it as it was before. I've got some in there. Uh, details. Settings again. Um, these are here because we can now, I think in this version or the last version we added, that you can map the domains to multiple different domains to different LDAPs. So if these were, uh, I guess, the, your companies that you have work, work with, um, you could have a different LDAP for each one of them and then they sign in separately rather than maintaining one LDAP across the whole whole board. Um, and then our role, um, dynamic roles, where we could say what people can and can't do by creating a new roles. Another one that really changed a lot. We've got a summary of infrastructure is a bit, kind of a cleaner version, but as we drill in, we start with our zones. Uh, we can, from there, we can kind of drill down into the different things you have there. So it's you primary storage in zone one, and there's my primary storage. How are we doing? Not long. Okay. 
Is there any area you'd particularly like to see, as I've managed to fill time? One oh. you, you've logged in uh, a new to show us something as admin in the events. Uh, what were you going to show there? No, I was coming in here because I needed to get into the things like domains I couldn't see from the other side and these, as I was working down, uh, global settings and stuff. There was I. Or global settings, what have you. Okay, is there anything else? Yep. Could you explain this uh, invitation on projects? So under projects, um, there are two modes it can work. One is where um, there's a global setting called invite required or something, projects.invite.required. Um, so the idea is potentially you don't want to be able to force people into your project or people don't want you to be able to just grab them and stick them in your project. Um, so there's a global variable where you say you have to invite them and it would send them an email to their email address to say they've been invited uh, and put now the little red link there to say they've been invited and then they have to accept to go into a project. Um, otherwise you add someone to the project and they don't kind of have a choice, they just end up in the project. So before just now you have a representation, representation of the GUI as a lot to... That's it. Thing, uh, project invite required. <coughs> and if you're going to send the get email, send it via email, you need to tell it the um, basic um, SMTP stuff it needs to know, that needs to know to send it. And obviously, you can see there's an expiry <coughs> time for that project as well, uh, for that invite. So, if someone else's hand, did I see over? Yeah? This one question I'd like to ask. Um, if you if you're a customer and you um, have got the have got a domain admin something like this, mm -hmm. is there any new way to actually see how much of your allocated resources you are actually using? So maybe the domain got 24 gigs of RAM right. allocated, and maybe on the dashboard you can see that you have allocated 20 or 24 gigabytes of RAM. So is there any handy way to, to uh, have an overview for the domain admins? Um, I don't think... Right now, all we've added is what's already in the current UI. But that's certainly something we can look at adding in somewhere. I'll come to uh, the best way to do that, or the thing to do next, with the kind of last two pieces here. Um, uh, so we're just coming up to the tech preview. Um, so we'll have, we hope, equivalent functionality to the current UI. So we know there might be the bug here and there, but we'll we'll then work on those to get to what will probably be the summer. Uh, there's normally a summer release, July, August, September time, uh, and that's where we'll say, right, it's done. You could use this in production. It's good to go, and it'll have the all the current functionality, everything kind of working that we have, and probably new things as well. And then, the end of uh, next year, we remove the old UI from the code base, so that release would only have the new UI in it. Now, obviously, if someone doesn't upgrade from the summer one for five years, they'll still have the old UI available to them, and that's fine. But from this point onwards, if people upgrade, they'll have to work with the new UI. So we're kind of obviously gi giving people, if you like, fair warning that this is going to change because it's going to be a big change. And getting this out, tech previews, giving time for people to look at documentation, look at how it might work, and also have suggestions. Oh. Oh, on the previous slide there, it said winter 2021. Yeah. Do you, do you mean? 20. 20 to 21. This yeah. winter? Yeah. Next winter as well. Yeah, because, yeah, well, yeah, depends. Winter spans years, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's very yeah, I can, when, when we come back to this in a year's time, we still haven't done it, then I'll say, no, no, no it says 21. <laughs> oh, oh, winter in which hemisphere? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, as I say, what, what can you do? 
Um, first off, obviously try it out. From there, either submit some bug reports, submit suggestions. There is actually, I think, I'm pretty sure down the bottom row, it's stuck in a little um, uh, link to add things in GitHub. So if I get to a normal view of this, if I lost my mouse too much, oh, that did it. Where's my mouse? Here we are. Where's the screen? Oh, here it is. Um, what do I need to get to? Some dashboard, that'll do it. There we go. Report bug. So that'll take you straight into GitHub to be able to report a bug uh, if need be. Um, submit suggest suggestions, so uh, domain admins being able to see how much of their resources being used in the domain. Um, but then, obviously, even more helpfully, learn Vue.js or get your the guys you've got working with you or for you to learn Vue.js and start helping with bug fixes or adding functionality and start taking some of those ideas and just adding them in. It's, a, it's, it's an open source project. It, it's, uh, it is still just CloudStack. It's got its own repo, but it's still just a uh, Apache CloudStack project um, where the more the merrier, the more people who, part of the point of having a new UI was having a new framework that could encourage and make it easier for people to get involved and work with it, um, not just for being a Glixie new front end. A lot of it was about, well, how do we make it so that people can contribute that much easier? And that has been the So Close I Can Almost Smell It intro to CloudStacks Primate. Thank you. Oh, one more question. I have, oh. I have one uh, semi-important question. Okay. <laughs> and uh, that's before, how, before you ask it, if anybody wants to grab a quick yeah. drink or anything yeah. while we're doing questions, um, we're how are you going to integrate the new UI into the existing cloud stack uh, management server? Um, because right now uh, we're kind of beta-ish testing it in-house, yeah. and uh, I discovered that the uh, development build process is a bit uh, messy. So for which? For for the uh, for private. Right. Uh, so I figured out how to uh, actually build uh, like a, what's it called? Uh, just like a